So I would like to begin uh, my presentation with giving respect to the cow and the goat. Um, those are two important animals to Norway throughout the centuries and up to the present time. The cow is especially important part of rural Norwegian farms and has not changed much since the Viking times and even earlier. Many of our collection pieces I will be showcasing today represent dairy production in the 1700s through about the early 1900s. However, there are two modern day pieces in our collection that I like to share. Um, the first is the girl with the, um, the young cow or the heifer, I guess we would say. Um, this was carved in 1970 by Leif Melgard, who actually immigrated to Minneapolis in 1920. And then on the right, we have a lady that's milking a goat. This I'm sure is something that many of you um, recognize. It's a henning piece. And these were very popular for tourism in about the 1960s. He did um, pieces on rural um, farm life and folk, um, folklore as well. So I just wanted to start that giving um, credit to both the cow and the goat. Um, even though I'm going to be talking a lot about milk, pr milk production with dairy, a lot of that um, is very similar with the goat production of milk as well. Um, the cow just being a little um, more so than the goat. So um, I'm not trying to slight either or. In fact, a small, a small tidbit for you is that there's about 34,000 dairy goats in Norway right now. And they actually produce about 12,000 tons of yate toast or the brown cheese a year. So that's a lot of yate toast. Okay, let's go to our next picture, Josh. Here we have um, talking about the majority of the butter in the early days in Norway was produced at the setter or the summer farm. Cows were taken up to the summer farm or in the alpine meadows um, once the meadows were green for the cows to feed on and kept there until late summer or maybe even the early signs of a snowflake falling. It was the setter where the farm's majority of the year's butter and cheese was produced, not in the valley, but up in the summer farm. This is a Knut Nelson photo, and it's of a summer farmer setter in the high meadows. If you look closely, you can see two horses that are packed with probably butter and cheese to bring down to the valley um, to bring to market to sell. And you can see one of the containers on one horse and then some packing on the other. Um, also up in the left hand corner, that's probably the fiosa or the barn where um, the cows would be milked. Um, I don't know if this is the entire herd or if it's part of it, but um, that's a nice size herd for um, a summer farm and probably maybe would even have to go into the barn twice with the milking. Um, you can also see in the background, one of the dairy maids is actually holding a pail and that looks very much like a metal pail. So this was not an earlier picture, uh, but a later one, maybe in the, the early 1900s or late, very, very late 1800s. Um, the Badea had a lot of work to do. She would work 16 hours, if not more or less a day. She not only had to milk the cattle or the, the cattle or the goats, but she had to process this milk. And also in the processing part of it, that means washing out a lot of those stave containers for the next day. Lots of work to do. So the next picture, I'm, I have to share um, my experience of my younger days in Norway. I was alter, also a setter budea. Um, I had my own summer farm working for a man in the Neshkogen area, not too far from Uppdal. I had 24 cows and on the left, um, I'm opening the gate and letting them in for milking in the evening. And to the right is the barn that I had, very old. Um, very, very old. Um, he is one that liked to keep tradition alive. And so he kept the life on the old setter. Um, the conveniences were that I had a generator in the barn. So I had two milking machines and a bulk tank to keep the milk cool. So after milkings, I'd wash the floor in the barn and then I would have the day free. So totally different. Um, nowadays, there are not many setters left. Some farmers, when I was leaving um, in the late 70s, um, farmers were going together and having one modern day um, barn up on their summer farms, they were sharing them and they would have um, a whole milking parlor system. So um, 
it's changed a lot. There's probably even fewer summer farms now this, um, this time of, 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 or era than there were earlier. Okay, so we'll go to the next page and we're gonna start our dairy production with milk. And okay, you can go to the next picture. This is actually a milk strainer. Um, we have a wooden milk strainer from about 1770 to the 1800s. The entire length from end of handle to end of handle is about 25 and a half inches. So that gives you an idea, the size of it. The pad in the in, inside of the bowl is actually made of cow hair. It's a little controversy there. Some say cow, um, some say horse, but um, many of the pieces in the museums, even in Norway say cow hair. Um, and it was uh, not crocheted or knitted, but this one was actually knoll bending, um, which is a, a spiral fashion or form of, um, of, of handwork as well. It's a round, loose textured mat. So this dates from somewhere between um, 1830 and 1870, the mat itself, and it's from the Gubernstal area. So the mat was put in there. Um, you can go to the next picture, Josh. The mat was put in the bottom of this uh, wooden strainer to sort out the, the chaff and the grass, anything, bugs maybe, uh, we don't want all of that in the milk. It, it's just like um, the milk filters that we used in dairying back in the um, 70s, 60s, 50s, you know, down from there. Um, also, you'll see that um, there is a cross in the bottom of the wood strainer. And we could, so that was, of course, where the milk would be strained through. But also, we were wondering, is it superstition? Or is it decoration? Or is it utility? Um, I would say it's maybe superstition. It's for protection, um, to keep the milk good, to keep bad and evil out of the milk. Um, so this is actually, um, the two arms are actually used to put over, rest them um, over the bowls or the churns so that they would be more stable when you're pouring the milk into um, the, the pail or the um, churn itself. Okay, next picture. Here we have, um, it's called a milk ringer or a, a milk bucket. Um, we have, it's made out of stave construction as you can see, which means it's individual pieces of wood that are put together. Um, it's about six or eight inches in height and it's about 12 to 15 inches, 12 to 15 inches wide. So that gives you a little bit idea of uh, the size of that. They were actually used to put the milk or cream um, into the into these after it was um, poured out of the bucket and then it was they were placed on top of each other in about four or six rows. The milk was actually left standing for about a week or more before it was even skimmed. The cream was skimmed off the top. And then once the cream was skinned off the top, then it would stand another week before it was churned and that would be um, the, the cream of it that would be churned into butter. So in the later years, they would maybe let them stand four or five um, days, but in earlier days, it was a lot longer. So you had a sour butter and the sour creams. And I even, I used to churn butter for my grandma in one of the glass daisy churns, and she would keep the cream on the back of her wood stove, uh, which is what she used for cooking, um, for maybe two or three days as well before she would churn it. It also makes it easier for the butter to churn if it's a little bit sour versus fresh right out of the cow. So the leftover sour milk was used for cooking or it was made into the gummelost or any other sour milk cheeses. And the sour milk would be poured into sour cream containers where it would stand until cheese, until they were ready to make cheese. Um, you have to remember that they didn't have 24, 30 cows, so they couldn't make cheese and butter every day after the milking. They would have to save it until they would get enough um, to do the whole process. Um, I want to talk about the stave construction, which was the most popular technique of many of the household vessels in rural Norway. Um, buckets and pans, kegs, porridgers, butter containers, ale bowls, they were all made, um, mostly made out of stave construction. And you might be asking, why stave? 
Well, when you use liquid in these, um, they will, the staves will contract and they'll become tight. Um, so you have a nice waterproof um, container. If you have a solid piece of wood, as you'll see later on in some of the pictures, um, they are going to have crack, they may have more tendency to crack from the different um, moisture and humidity in the air. This, they, this method, they will not crack. Um, you also see that you have the bands that are um, formed to, they're probably dampened and then formed around the stave containers um, to hold all the staves together. Okay, um, we'll go to the next one. Um, when we're talking about um, the butter and the cream and the milk and keeping it um, in the stave containers, um, one of the things that they will do with some of that sour cream before it's too sour is they may make porridge out of it. And what they need when they're making porridge is a good whisk. Well, you know what our whisks are. This is what they had for their whisks back in the day. Um, the one on the top is a beater that was made out of about 10, about 10 peeled birch twigs. And then it was bound with twisted birch root in two places. Um, this was about 14 inches long. And on the bottom, you actually see a turu or a tevela, which is made of a peeled and polished pine limb with a ring of about five upshooting small branches at the end. So what they would do is, if this would be the, the turu, they, and then down here are the branches, you would go like so back and forth. And that is what would, um, would mix up and would beat the uh, porridge so that it didn't get lumpy. Now, when you're taking out your real Christmas trees at Christmas time, I have to mention that look at the top of your tree and oftentimes if it's a pine tree, you will see those five twigs coming out of that tree. So here you are, you can make your own turu um, for decoration. And if you want, you can get adventuresome and even use it. Um, everyday porridges, however, were not made from the really good fresh, um, you know, newly soured cream. A lot of times milk production um, and the cream uh, was used for butter because butter was such a commodity in Norway to the rural farmers. So they may have porridge made out of oatmeal or rye or barley um, and wheat if they're on the more Eastern part of Norway. And they may only mix it with water instead of milk or they may mix it with the whey. Um, so the um, nice fine porridges I will talk about later were saved for special occasions. Okay. And the next picture we have a grutfat, uh, which is a turned wooden bowl. It's one piece of wood. Um, and what they would do is they, when they were making the ruma grout, and the ruma means sour, and grout means porridge. So a lot of the ruma grout we get over here is made with a sweet cream and milk versus the sour. I'm sure you've, those of you that have been to Norway have tasted the difference. So they have to draw that butter out of that milk or sour milk and cream. And so the butter would be put in the center bowl and then the ruma grout would be poured on the outside of the bowl and then you dish it up and eat it as so or they may have had dumplings. They may have had dumplings, again, made out of the different grains and they would put them on the outside and they'd put the pork grease um, or some type of fat in the middle for serving. Um, <clears throat> bowls that were turned, you know, are a old common object and they were produced by turning way back um, evidence to the Osberg ship, um, which was way back in the ninth century. Um, also, I want to mention that there were different varieties of wood that were suitable for um, our kitchen objects. Birch was used much for the bowls and the cups and finely carved drinking bowls. And for the stave vessels, a lot of the coniferous wood for stave um, would be used, such as um, juniper and pine. Um, they liked to use juniper, especially because that would take away some of the, that doesn't leave a flavor like some woods may, may leave. So juniper was often used a lot even for cleaning the churns and cleaning the stave containers. The hoops um, that we had on the stave containers were made out of split hazels or juniper or birch or maybe another type of wood that they would have had around. But those are pretty much the normal ones that were or the common ones used um, for the stave containers. 
On the next picture, we do have a porridge bowl. I love this. I love the colors. And this is a porridge or butter bowl. It's actually for serving out of. It's not one to eat out of individually. Again, um, it's stave construction and it has the willow bands at the top and the bottom uh, and they're dovetailed together and then they were um, pegged to the bowl. This is from the Gubranstal Tretton area and it dates of about 17 to 1800. The carving you see is an acanthus leaf design. Um, the Canthus design was med, uh, Mediterranean. The plant comes from the Mediterranean area. So you can, you know that there was travel in there in early days um, to get this design and then used for the wood carving, which is very common. Um, a Canthus carving was, um, has found its way into a lot of the smaller objects as well. And on the next pay, on the next slide, um, here we have an umbar or porager, which was used for carrying porridge. Um, and this is also made out of stave construction with three bands um, holding it to get the staves together. Um, it's up to, uh, um, you can see the handle on the top, um, the, the protruding up pieces on the handle, it's actually one stave one complete piece of wood. So those would go up, you'd see there's a little hole in the handle facing us. There maybe would be a little peg from the lid that would fit into that. And then the other side would slide down over the other handle on the opposite side. Um, you can see there's different symbols on it that were burnt into this, a svitakor or wood burning. You have the sun circles. You have on the bottom, you have a, a six, what is it? Three, six and eight armed uh, motif that could be also resembling the sun. Um, they were burnt into the wood. So we wonder, is this for protection or again, is it for decoration? People before Christianity were very superstitious. Um, they had to they marked everything to protect it from the Huldra folk or the trolls or um, all of these spirits that would come down from the mountains or from the water. So they did use a lot of different um, um, symbols to, for protection. The two-headed horse um, is a sign of strength and fertility, and that was used often in um, ale vessels and different um, um, utensils or vessels as well. Then on the next slide, um, we have um, an, another example of an ambar or a storage container. This is one again that has a canthus, um, slight acanthus carving on it. Um, it dates to about 1800 and it was, it's from the Gubernstal area again. Um, in the, in the 1900s, the stave construction in this ambar in particular, I should say, the, the, not just anyone, but the ambar in particular, um, became one of Norway's national symbols, along with the kuba stool, which is a wooden seat made out of one trunk, um, one trunk of wood, um, and a canthus carving itself. So with the kuba stool and the canthus carving and the ambar, um, they were all made Norwegian symbols in the 1900s. So there was a lot of folklore um, that was associated with butter. So now we're going to go in and talk a little bit about butter. Butter was a commodity. It was one thing on the farm that they did have a surplus of usually. Um, and as I said, they were their highest production was when they were in the summer farms. Um, the land value on these farms were expressed in measures of butter. And it was also used for trade, such as money. As for, as for the folklore, uh, many know stories about the Christmas Nyssa. One of them that I have heard is that at Christmas time, many of you know, the Nyssa would come to the barn and expect his bowl of porridge to be there waiting for him. One night uh, on Christmas Eve, the farmer wanted to trick the Nyssa. So he took the slab of nice big slab of fresh butter and he put it uh, in the middle of the um, porridge. So when the Nyssa came, he didn't see it. Well, the Nyssa got very angry because he didn't have that butter on his porridge. So he went over to the, so he um, took the horse out and he killed that farmer's horse. That was his punishment for not putting butter in the porridge. But then when he went back to eat the porridge, he discovered that um, there was the butter in the porridge. It was just hidden inside. Funny, it had melted, but it was in the porridge. And so the Nyssa felt so bad that he went to the neighbor 
stole their horse and brought it back to this farmer so that he would replace the horse that he had killed, seeming there was butter on the porridge. So that's one of the stories, one of many. Um, most summer farms had to collect milk over several days to get enough cream to churn, as we had mentioned earlier. So keep in mind that depending on the size of the kettles they have to work with, they would have to start collecting to fill those kettles. Usually it seemed like they would collect about 25 gallons of milk before they could start their churning. Um, so they've collected enough milk and it's been sitting on the shelves now for X amount of days. They will now take a skimmer and they will skim off that cream, which will be added to the clean and rinsed churns. Um, the longer it took to collect enough cream, the less fresh taste of butter there would be. So it was best if the cream could be allowed to stay cool if they could so that it remained sweeter until everything could be fermented or curdled at once. If they had springs or streams beside him, they could keep, they would keep the milk in, in those. If they had any type of a underground um, cellar or cave or ditch, they maybe would keep it in that as well. Any place where they could keep it cooler if possible. It was easier to get butter um, um, if it was a little sour as well. So they begin churning the butter in these stave constructions. This, these two churns have dashers on them. So the paddles would be going up and down and moving the cream up and down for um, taking the, separating the whey and the um, butter from each other. I shouldn't say whey, I should say buttermilk. Um, so to prevent the witches also from entering these churns so that the butter would churn up nicely and they wouldn't um, have a problem getting it churned into butter because that did happen. The churns would many times have um, a cross marked on the bottom of the churn and it may also have a cross marked on the cover of the churn again to keep all evil out of um, the, the uh, butter that they were churning. Also the, the beaters in the churn that was used to actually beat the butter were shaped in the style of a cross. Um, you could have had maybe more than four, but they had shaped um, exactly like a cross for protection as well. Or so it said. Cleaning of the churns was very important. They scrubbed them out, they rinsed them out with cold water. Again, did they live close to a cold water source or did they have to walk away for this cold water? Then they were scalded. And then um, they were stood in the sun to dry, um, facing the sunshine so that the sun could, could dry them out. And also there is a lot of cleansing with the heat of the sun and the rays as well. Or they'd have to tip them upside down if it was you know, a rainy season, which could be many times in Trindelag, West Coast, whatever. Um, okay, now we'll go to the, um, the butter bowl. This is where they would wash the butter. Once that butter um, was separated from the butter, from the butter fat or the butter milk, they had to wash, wash it. Um, they had to take out as much of the buttermilk as possible. Otherwise the butter had a better chance of going rancid. So they would put the butter in this bowl and they would use lots of cold water and they would rinse it. They would knead it and wash it. And then they would put new fresh water in and they would do the same process until the water came out clear. And once it came out, came out clear, then they would salt it and then they would either pack it into their stave containers or they would pack it into what other kind of containers that they would put their butter into. Um, <clears throat> the buttermilk then could be used for making other cheeses. It could be used for cooking. They drank it. I know I remember sitting at the table and my grandfather would have me sitting there with this glass waiting for the buttermilk after my sister and I were sitting there hours trying to churn that small churn of butter. Okay. The next slide will show the butter paddle on the left. This was used more so than the hands. Your hands were warm, so um, you didn't want the heat of your hands to, um, you know, I shouldn't say melt the butter, but um, you, wanted, you wanted it to be nice and cold so it would stay together and wouldn't go back into the buttermilk again. So you'd use this paddle and you would work the butter and you would kind of knead the butter and work the salt into it as well. On the right hand, on the right hand um, picture, that is a picture of, it's called a smur, okay, what is it called? I just lost my train of thought, a smur cooler. The smur cooler was actually, once the butter had been made and clean, you would take like a strip of butter, maybe about an inch wide, and you would 
put it on the end of the, um, the, the paddle there, and then you would go like so with that paddle, and that would make a nice ball of butter, but it would also leave those lines in the butter as well. So they would use those on the tables as little butter balls um, instead of having taking the butter out of the butter ambar. And these were used quite often. Um, these are actually about nine inches long, so that gives you an idea for size as well. Okay, the next slide. There are different methods of construction we're going to be talking about. It's wood turning, which we covered with the grutfat or the, the um, container for serving the Roma grout. Um, we're talk, gonna talk about tur um, turning we did, and the stave containers as we talked about, um, corner joining and bent wood boxes. And this is a sample of a bent wood box. Bent wood construction was actually the oldest wood technique um, used in the Norwegian folk culture. Uh, it was formed, uh, it was found a lot in rural Norway and how it was formed is you take a thin um, piece of wood, you would steam it or you would wet it, um, preferably in warm water. And then you'd have a form that you would bend this thin wood around. It would stay on that form to dry. <clears throat> and then after it was dried, it was taken off the form and it was pegged together. Then you would take with the bottom, you would have a, a straight flat bottom that you would peg on to the bottom of the container. And then the cover, you do the same technique as the main body, but you would make it larger to fit around the outside of the main box. Then that was pegged. And you can see on the right hand one, you see that they were laced with um, birch root uh, to hold those together. And birch root uh, was, would grow a lot um, towards the top of the ground in really um, swampy areas. So you could just pull them up. You may have to split them and then um, sew with them, but you would have them uh, um, somewhat damp when you were working. Well, you had to have them damp when you were working with them as well so that they wouldn't split on you. For decoration on this, um, you see there is some coal rosing. You can see the little diamonds. And this was actually incised into the wood where a very, with a very sharp pointed knife, or they could have used a sharp pointed object of some kind like a nail. It was etched into the wood. Then you take some, um, some bark from a tree and you would make sawdust out of that, or you could take suet from the, from the stove and you would rub that into the incisions of the wood. And then once you oiled over this, that design would just jump out at you and you have your coal rosing. Um, so I think that this is probably just design and, and not so much um, protection, but um, that's my observation on it anyway. One of the things I like to mention too is for the spirits, you know, they weren't very smart. They were really kind of stupid. And if they got, if they got into anything that had any type of a zigzag motive to it, um, they would get lost in it. They couldn't find their way out. So um, some of the objects, if you see a lot of zigzag um, patterns on it, I think of zigzags on Norwegian sweaters, you know, at the bottom of the sweater or maybe around the cuffs or at the top, um, you know, they could get lost in those, zig those zigzags and then they, they never could make it into your body to harm you. So a lot of superstition there. Okay, these butter bowls actually were brought down to the valley um, throughout the summer and then used um, to bring to market again to be sold the butter in them anyway. Okay, here we have an, um, another container for butter. Um, this is a beautiful one. It's stave construction again. It has your wooden bands around the staves to hold them in place. You see the two arms that have extended um, the stave. Um, the cover is rounded. It has a nice handle on it. And on the bottom, you can see on the, one of the legs, that's called chip carving. That's another form of decoration, um, which was used um, in different areas of Norway as well. And then you have the zigzag pa pattern on the bottom. Um, so this was um, done medieval or even earlier, the chip carving was. Um, it usually consisted of a, a three-sided shaped gouge or a triangular one. Um, and it actually came to Norway um, through the Dutch 
um, through the Dutch and the Germans. They kind of claim fame to the old fine chip carving, where those on the West Coast um, probably have a larger um, chip carving designs and, and they claim that that's the Norwegian chip carving style when they're a little bit larger. Um, I've seen that their knives are a little different too, but then to a wood carver, you have more than one knife, right? You maybe have three or four for just one specific um, pattern. I know there's some wood carvers on here and I can imagine your wood carving knife collection. Um, then you have the burnt decor decoration or it's called Svidekor and that's an outgrowth of chip carving. It consists of repeated small patterns and elements like circles, stars, crosses that are burned in um, with uh, a stamp or again could be a sharp edged type of nail or something, anything to get it hot that would go into the wood um, to burn into it. And this was not any older than the 1600s. In later forms from about 1700s, there are also drawn lines and small points that were burned in. Okay. I also want to say that butter at the table, and you can keep this line, that the butter at the table was often served in these butter containers. Um, and it was also said that when they put the, the butter on bar or butter container on the table for Christmas Eve, that butter had to last through the Christmas holiday season, which was Epiphany. So um, they had to be fairly good size to, um, to last through that whole holiday time. Okay. Here, here is an unusual butter container as well. Um, you can see the whirling sun symbol on it. Um, those um, were for good fortune. They were meant, they were symbols for safety. They could be symbols of creation, of new life, um, creation of good flocks, good field, family. If, you, if the lines were whirling to the right, that usually symbolized time. And if the lines were whirling to the left, that would be more for seasonal rotation. Um, you can also see the crosses inside the cover and on the handle as well, which were probably for a protection as well. This is actually a piece that's turned. It's not stave construction, as you can see, but it is a turned piece. Um, and um, there is no bottom in it. These particular butter molds or bowls were filled from the bottom up. So the butter would have to go into, I'm talking with my hands, I'm sorry you can't see that, but the butter would go into the cover there so that when you pulled the cover up, you would have that beautiful rounded um, pattern on the butter when you begin serving it. And if you remember, I talked earlier about how solid wood has a tendency to crack where these staves um, are like built in cracks. Well, here you can see the crack on this on this lovely container. Um, probably too much moisture and humidity, and you know, variance in temperatures eventually caused it to crack. Okay. Um, so when they would take the butter to market, um, they would usually have a stamp that would resemble their family or their farm. This is a butter stamp or a butter mold. Um, I think it's maybe used more for um, the stamping of butter than molding it. Um, and this symbol actually resembles, re uh, represents the ram's horns on the top. Um, and then um, and then when you go farther down, um, one of the, it's, a, it's a symbol of um, agriculture, human fertility, which are really important in rural um, Norway as well. So um, it's another symbol that means something when you're marking the cheese, but also when the people would go to market, they would know where their, um, I'm sorry, butter was. Uh, they wanted to buy that particular butter, they would look for the stamp and they know that it came from that particular farm that they wanted it from. Um, I found my family stamp in an old Big Da book or um, family history book of the farm that um, some of my ancestors came from near Voss. And it's just a series of, series of lines. And I use that on the wood carvings or wooden pieces that I make as my identification. I never use, really use my initials. I use the old mested um, symbol for that. And then we also have, if you go to the next slide, just some examples of some other butter stamps. The one on the right actually has the heart on one side and the 
four bladed um, rosette or star on the other side. And then the one on the left is just an individual one. These are about four inches in length to give you an idea of the side, size of that. And again, they were used for stamping butter. Okay. And of course you could do it for decoration as well. Um, I wanted to show this, it's another butter box. It's made of the state construction as well. Um, a good example of this you can see is the top of the butter box and how on the bottom you have a small um, indentation out of the rim. And on the top you have the indentation but you have a small piece of wood um, coming protruding out of that. So what would happen is you would put this cover on your butter mold, you would slide, you would put in the top with the indentation or the piece of wood coming out of that little indentation there. You'd put that into the hole of the butter mold and then on the bottom part, then you would just slide that down over the stave. Um, to form a locks or a seal so that you could carry your um, bars without the tops falling off or, yeah, or so. <laughs> um, you can see the chip carved motif in here. It's a rosette or the sun symbol again, which is a much bigger um, chip carving design. And um, again, was it to protect the butter? Was it for good luck or was it just for decoration? Earlier days, we know that it was for protection. The next thing we're going to do is we're going, object we're gonna look at are the butter molds. And these are my absolute favorites. Um, they, they were used for both um, cow butter and she, cow butter, made butter made from cows, I'm sorry. Or they were made um, for yay toast where you'd put the brown goat cheese in them as well. Um, they had patterns when, they, when the butter was put into the molds, then the pattern would come out in the relief form. And as I said, butter did represent the worth, <clears throat> excuse me, the worth of the farm. So if you came to a wedding and you had this pedestal with this, this three, four pound um, block of decorated butter, you probably would think that the farm is maybe a little well off to do versus some of the other farms in the area. Okay. Um, this is actually a gift from the Nordmoor Museum in Norway. Okay. Um, and I, I had some other, um, yeah, I guess we can go to my video. That sounds good. So let's go to the video of how you use the butter mold. I'm sure some of you probably have a mold at home and you maybe will want to use it after you see this or you're not quite sure how to. This will just give you a little example of it. Okay. Here's how you fill the butter mold. If you have an older butter mold, soak it in the water for a couple hours. With this particular one, I've soaked it in the water for maybe an hour. This will help so the butter doesn't stick to it. You have a lid that's going to fit on the butter mold. Find the marking, match the marking to the top of the butter mold. Put the mold together. Some of yours will not fit together like this, but for this particular one, it fits as so. Then the pin goes in the butter mold to hold it all together. Okay, now we're ready to put the butter in the mold. I like to start by putting a little bit in the top first, and I use my fingers to work that down so that it is all in the mold. Then I'm going to fill each side. Again, I like to use my finger so I know I'm getting it packed in there. The other sides first before you fill the whole center at once. And when I know that I have all of the sides filled in, I'm going to take the rest of the butter and Pack it in the mold as such, like so, making sure every form and indentation is being filled. I'm going to even off the bottom. I should have had a little more butter in it, but for demonstration, this will be fine. It's packed in tightly. I'm going to put it on a plate. I'm going to put it in the refrigerator 
until it gets nice and cold. I like to leave it in overnight. Then I'll pull it out the next day and I'll have the mold as such. I'll pull out the pin. I'll open up the mold and if it's difficult to open, you can take a knife and just pry the edges open like so. Open the mold. There you have it. Pull off the top. Hopefully that stayed on. <laughs> there you go. And you have your little mold. This is a very small one. Usually I, this is an older one I have and it's quite large. This is the size I like to use for my Christmas table. But for demonstration purposes, I use this smaller mold. Then I will just take it, wash it with some warm water and soap, let it dry out, and it's ready for the next time. Good luck. Okay, so I hope this will inspire some of you to maybe use your butter molds instead of just having them sit in a cupboard somewhere. This is a butter mold uh, with chip carving in it. The scales are made from chip carving and you have the eyes and the fins that are made out of um, um, just drawn knife. I just wanted to um, share this with you. I thought it was a, an unusual one. And this is from about the 1800s. Okay, then we go to the kettle for making cheese. Um, it's a small copper kettle. This was probably not made um, used to make cheese on a summer farm because it is too small, but they did use these as well as iron kettles for making the cheese. One thing, if you're ever using a copper kettle um, for any type of cooking, you wanna make sure that you it's absolutely polished, polished, shiny, and very, very clean. Um, if you don't have it polished and clean, um, the um, chemicals can react with the lactic acid in the milk or the whey, and um, you're going to have some toxic food. So make sure it's very clean before you use it. Um, you know, you might think, why would they bring these items over to America? You'd think they'd have them here. Well, they used them for suitcases. So um, their copper kettle was probably packed with some food goods or kitchen items or clothing or, you know, items that they wanted to bring with them to America. And they probably didn't have suitcases. So this way they could pack them. Um, they'd have the kettle as well as the items inside of them. Um, so it often about, they would often have to save about 25 gallons of milk before making cheese. Um, butter was a commodity that was, um, that was produced um, a lot on the satyrs. It was boiled down and then it was made into preem, the cow's milk. That would be the, um, after they had made the cheese and put the rennet in it. Okay, I need to back up. I'm very sorry. <laughs> For the cheese making, they would use a rennet and they would, separate the curds from the whey. Um, the curds would be used for the cheese and the whey then would be boiled down and could be used for um, other cheeses as well. Um, the yetos, for example, is actually the whey from the cheese and the cooking time in it, it would have to be boiled for hours. The cooking time and the heat is what would give it the color and its thickness. A lot of that water had to be boiled off of that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, then the, what they would take is the, um, the leftovers from the whey, if you're making your white cheeses, would be used to make preem, which some of you have heard of, uh, which is cow's milk, and then the yay toast would be the goat's milk. Um, you've probably heard the story about um, Anna Hav was the one that supposedly invented um, the yay toast. She was from Gobrenstal, and in the 1863, she mixed some, mixed some of her cow's milk and goat's milk together, and um, that's how the um, yay toast became, or I should say the way of that. She was cooking the whey and then some milk was mixed in with that. Um, from sour skim milk, old cheese or gummelost was made, which was a real art in making that. Um, and um, the sweet skim milk was used for the softer cheeses and the white cheeses. 
once the cheeses were made, and that's a whole other program, cheese making. Once the um, cheese was made and the curd was separated from the whey, the curd would be taken, next picture, and it would be um, probably put in some type of a cheesecloth and then weighted down in one of these uh, woven baskets. Um, this is actually made out of the birch root as well, and it's called a, a coiled strainer. Um, this is from, probably from about 1800 to the 1830s. Um, for you might wonder, well, how did they curdle the milk? Um, one of the ways they curdled the milk was using a rennet and a rennet was actually from the stomach of a calf. So once the calf was born and it was a couple days old and had been drinking the sweet milk of the mother, it would be slaughtered. Um, <clears throat> and then the stomach, uh, the fourth stomach actually of this calf would be removed, it would be washed the contents of this fourth stomach would also be washed, put back into the stomach. And once it's all cleaned and washed, it would be hung to dry. And then they would take pieces of this um, and used in with the um, milk in order to curdle it so that you'd get the curd from the whey. Okay, and then they drain it in that strainer. Um, here we have a cheese box as well. You can see this is the dovetailing on the edges like we were talking about. Um, it's an open box. Uh, the holes are for drainage, as you can see, and the, the cheese was then packed down into that and the whey could drain through the holes of the um, box. Okay, the next one. Here's another cheese box. Um, this was actually one that you could take apart, as you can see. And on the bottom, you have um, the sign of the cross um, for drainage as well. Um, this particular box, as I said, can be taken apart. So you can have your nice formed cheese with this, with this particular form. Um, the next one. It's also a bentwood cheese box. Um, you can see the lacing with the birch bark root and the chip carving on the top with the small um, diamond borders, the bold crisscross portions of the cover as well. This could have um, also, you'd probably have a wrapped cheese, um, cheese and placed in this box. And this is for storage again, not for draining. The, the whey has already been drained out and now we have our cheese in our cheese box. Okay. Um, next picture. Um, I like this one um, because it demonstrates or shows two different types of construction. Um, this is a cheese box that was made either, either out of pine or fir. Um, it was bent wood, as you can see, and um, it has the little zigzags on the bottom, and it has lots of symbolism, symbolism that's um, throughout and burnt onto this box, a svitakor or um, wood burning. Um, <clears throat> the bentwood cover fits over this box. So if you go to the next page, you will the next slide, you will see the construction of that. You have two bands on the bottom that are holding that stave construct construction to bed together. And then you have um, the bent wood cover that'll fit over those stave containers for storage. This is actually, um, um, from Boverdalen, Norway. And 17th through the 19th century, those were the early years that they started Svidekor. And later years, they started rose mauling. So they actually did some rose mauling over this um, box after the carving was done on it. Okay, the next slide. Um, this shows um, a Ostband, which was, this one is particularly is Hardanger, made out of Hardanger embroidery, and it fits around a large block of cheese. They use these a lot on a four pound block of uh, yay toast. It was used so that you put your hands on this particular cloth while you're slicing the cheese. It would be fastened with um, like a pewter button that was almost like a stick pin. So you would put that into the cheese after you've wrapped the cloth around it. Um, and this is made out of probably a linen seeming um, a hardanger cloth, seeming it has hardanger on it, but also many of them were embroidered as well. So this is called an ostband or a cheese band. Um, they were really popular around the 1800s to about the 1950s um, for using on cheese blocks. 
So many of these items um, that you've seen um, today were brought to America by immigrants. They were all functional, but they also were brought here in hopes that they could carry their traditions along to their new country and their new land here in America. So I hope I've given you some in inspiration um, on these pieces. Um, there's so much to say about cheese making, about butter making, about wood decoration, about construction. It's very hard to get them all in, but I know you want some time for questions too. So I actually want to end with this um, cheese slicer, which is a greatest invention ever for cutting and slicing yay toast. It was actually um, um, discovered, or I should say designed and made or invented by a Norwegian carpenter in about 1925. He was using a lot of his planes in, in his woodworking and he thought, well, this can cut, this can slice wood so well, you know, when I'm planing wood. Something like this would be great with cheese for slicing cheese. So here you go, you have the Norwegian cheese slicer. Um, and it's great, especially if you have a nice chunk of yetos to slice. So there you have it. And if anyone has any questions, maybe we have some time to answer them. Thank you so much, Darlene. I learned a great deal and I love the video. Everyone else did too, I think, because there's a couple of questions. Okay. How cold is the butter that you put into the mold? Okay, I use room temperature butter. Um, I'm sorry I didn't say that. I use room temperature butter. Um, and I like to make the mold wet so that the butter doesn't stick to it. Um, if it's an old mold that you've had around for, you know, a generation or two, whatever, um, you can soak that maybe a little bit longer than an hour or two so that we get, you know, just get that condi wood conditioned again. And then it's important to put it in the refrigerator. Um, I like to do it overnight so that we know that butter is cold. And then the sides usually more so than not come out very nicely. Don't put it in the freezer. That's maybe just a little too much for the butter mold. And when you're pulling the top off, then that may come off too if it's a frozen butter, but keep it nice and cold and room temperature butter. Sure. Okay. Where did you get your molds? Um, my largest mold that you saw in the film was actually uh, from my grandparents. Um, <clears throat> I had one that I bought at a Hoos Fleet back in the 70s. There was a period in time um, between the 70s and maybe 90s that um, the Hoos Fleets were just a little, they didn't have a lot of the handmade items like they used to have. And then going to Norway, I had a hard time finding them because I wanted to bring them back you know, for my family. But in the last maybe 10, 15 years now, that smallest one was the one that I found at a Hoos Fleet. I'd like to have found a bigger one, but that was, those were pretty much the ones that I would find. Um, and, um, you know, um, the smaller one, I don't think it was hand carved on the inside. I think they maybe used a Dremel tool or something. It was just, you could just tell. But um, I hope that, um, I hope I can carve some. I have them all made out. I just have to carve the inside. So they are a treasure. So if you go to Norway and check out some of the Husfleden's more in the rural areas, you might have some success in finding them. Great. Um, and I hope people will check the chat box. Anne Sather had a similar experience to you where she worked on a dairy farm in Norway in 1979. So I hope everyone will check out the chat for that uh, recollection. Um, we, Sue is wondering if there will be a class focused on cheese in the future. Are you game to teach a cheese class, Darlene? Um, well, I don't know. Um, I've been making a lot of cheese just to educate myself more here on different temperatures and stuff. It's possible. If not, we know somebody that could teach it. <laughs> We have a lot of cheesemakers in this area. We also have a goat farmer um, who has who I buy my goat milk from. Um, and so, you know, we talk about using the whey of the, the goat milk and um, I make some, you can make some nice white cheese, you know, cooking up the whey almost. It's like a cottage cheese, but very flavorful. And we'll have to talk to Josh about that, right, Loran? <laughs> exactly. Darlene teaches so many wonderful food classes for us, so we'll, we'll have to do those and more perhaps in the future. Uh, Liz wanted you to clarify about um, traditional symbols of Norway, and she said, did you say that Ambar and Kubastuler were named traditional symbols of Norway? Um, that's what I've had in some information of mine, that it was the Ambar 
Um, and I'm not sure, I know Dick's on here, he could have answered that for me. I'm not sure if it was the ambar with the acanthus or if acanthus carving in other forms along with the ambar and the kubastol. Those were actually three items that, that were um, kind of representing um, the folk arts of Norway. Did that help you? I hope so. Are there other questions for Darlene? I'm unable to type in. So my question is on one of the umbars for, for uh, cheese, no, for butter, there was swirling design and you said if it went to the right, it was something. If it went to the left, it was seasonal rotation. Can you mm -hmm. clarify that for me? Yes, if it went to the right, it was more seasonal. And if it went to the left, it was more with time. And that could be like maybe days, months um it could be um the seasonal would be maybe more geared towards um like planting season growing season you know that type but to the left it was more with time which is you know not just quarterly with seasons but time throughout the year okay and there's a lot right. on symbolism too is that right loran you've done a lot on symbolism do you have anything to add to that just sounds just right <laughs> um, there's so much on symbolism. It's really an interesting fact. I wish somebody would write an English, a book in English about them because there's so many Norwegian books and symbolism out there. 